So welcome everyone on Gelato. And I'm here today with Benedict Bünz, uh, the co-founder and chief scientist uh, of Espresso Systems. Uh, very nice to have you here, Benedict. How are you today? Thank you, Louis. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Great, great. So Espresso is obviously uh, quite interesting recently, quite a lot of announcements. You guys did a successful Series B, uh, I think led by A16Z amongst others. Um, just a disclaimer here, I also invested in that round. Uh, so definitely uh, very interesting. And I think a lot of people, let, let's start right there. A lot of people probably heard of Espresso now for the first time uh, recently because uh, shared sequencing is gaining a lot of uh, attention, especially in the Ethereum alignment camp, it is gaining attention from the likes of Justin Drake uh, because of something called base sequencing, which is which, which we can talk about later as well, which Espresso is now also a um, main contributor to. Uh, but actually, I, I'm one of the people who have heard of you guys, like, I think it was two years ago on the Zero Knowledge podcast um, with Anna Rose, and I think it was Ben, your co-founder on there, talking about privacy systems. So, So how did you... Yeah, how did you get from there? I, I suppose you were there from the beginning pretty early on, uh, given that you're co-founder. But yeah, how, how did you guys go from there? What, what ended up happening there? What, why are you not doing that anymore? And, and how did you end up in shared sequencing, which I, I know you, you did a, a year ago, and now it's like base sequencing. So, so what's the story here? Exactly, yeah. So um, I guess a little bit about my background. And, and so Ben and I... Um, uh, so we have four co-founders, uh, Charles, Joe, Ben, and I, and uh, Ben and I and uh, did our PhDs together at Stanford, and we actually were working on zero-knowledge proofs. Um, so just, you know, sort of fairly deep in the tech, uh, you know, developing zero-knowledge proofs. So, uh, you know, when we decided to, to uh, build a startup, we sort of, it was kind of the natural fit to work on something uh, zero-knowledge proof related. Um, and we were originally building sort of a privacy uh, one. Um, and as part of that, you know, we were like, well, we need to make this efficient and we want to be sort of Ethereum aligned. So we're, we were kind of building this as a roll up or as a roll up uh, like thing. Um, but then, you know, at some point uh, we realized that, you know, there's, there were already, you know, some good privacy projects out there, and then maybe, you know, the demand for privacy wasn't that high. So uh, we pivoted, and uh, we've always been interested in uh, in kind of the the roll up space, obviously, and we think that this is, you know, kind of like the way to scale Ethereum's and blockchains in general. Uh, but again, there were already a lot of roll up projects out there. But we had built, you know, as part of our privacy L one, we had actually built this really fast and uh, uh, high performant consensus uh, layer. Um, so we'd build a consensus uh, uh, product, um, which we now call, call Hotshot. And essentially what we're seeing is that, you know, all of these rollups were happening, but it was defragmenting the, the, uh, the ecosystem. So, um, you know, the one of the big, I guess attractions of Ethereum initially is that you can build your application and then interact with any other application, any other smart contract that is built on Ethereum. And you don't even have to, you know, ask for permission. They just sort of naturally interact with each other, right? Like if there's a DEX marketplace, then it naturally interacts with a lending protocol, which naturally interacts with the stablecoin and so on and so forth. And if I have these different roll-up ecosystems, you know, even these different roll-ups, and then within these, you know, like uh, I have the same ecosystem, that then within these different roll-up ecosystems, then suddenly this interoperability story becomes a lot more complicated. Um, and one of the main reasons and fundamental reasons why it becomes complicated is because each of the roll-ups uh, sort of acts as kind of their own mini chain um and it has their own sequencer so each chain has the their own person you know or server that decides what transactions get included in what order um and uh the the they cannot cheat so the roll-up ensures that 
you know, the, all the transactions are valid, either using a zero knowledge proof or an optimistic proof, but still you have different people deciding what transactions are included in what order. So uh, this, this basically, we can talk about this more, why exactly this is the case, but uh, this, this separate sequencing sort of hurts interoperability on many, many different layers. So uh, what we're thinking is, you know, and what we're seeing is that, uh, is there a better way to solve this? Uh, and this is how we got into the topic of shared sequencing. And the idea is basically to allow different sequencers uh, to interoperate and uh, together or, or through some uh, marketplace to basically um, sell the sequencing rights to uh, single entities that can then, you know, become shared sequencers. So they can sequence multiple rollups at the same time and then they can satisfy uh, sort of the technical term is that they can satisfy user intents over multiple rollups. So say a, a user wants to atomically execute two transactions on two rollups. So they want to buy something, you know, they want to buy ETH on one DEX on rollup A, and then they want to sell ETH on, uh, you know, DEX uh, two on rollup B but they want to have it happen atomically. So either both of these transactions happen or none of them happen, right? And uh, right now, if they have separate sequencers, then you know, even if the sequencers are honest, they cannot guarantee that this actually happens atomically, right? One transaction might get in, the other one might not get in, or you know, the market has moved before the other transaction comes in. Um, and what shared sequencing allows you is to guarantee basically this atomic execution because you have one person that basically controls both rollups at the same time. Um, and if we can enable this, and this is what we're, we've built at Espresso and, and what we're working on is at Espresso, then uh, you know, this can significantly help with interoperability. Uh, it can help with faster bridging. It can or faster and cheaper bridging. Uh, it can help with arbitrage. I, I can, you know, for example, buy an NFT on one chain and then pay for it on another chain. You know, there's just a lot of scenarios where, um, you know, this can basically get, bring us back to, um, you know, give us the both the scalability of rollups that we all know and love, but uh, basically give us bring us back to kind of the interoperability that we know and love from sort of basic Ethereum. Cool, nice, and that's already quite quite a big intro. So uh, for for yeah. you listeners, I would I would say shared sequencing right now is definitely one of these topics that makes your head spin, and it's <laughs> def definitely a, a a very complex topic. Um, it's definitely still in research, right? Like it, it's not like everything is clear and figured out yet. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, but but yeah. So maybe to help uh, myself and also the listeners in this conversation that we will have today maybe one thing we could do now is try to get some of the important definitions out the way and i think ethereum researchers uh, have really done a great job at confusing people here nowadays because uh, there's a lot of abstractions and we, we we give this we give different names to essentially the same thing and often we give different names to it based on where in the modularization we look at it, right? So, for example, the way I, how, what is a sequencer, right? One way to describe a sequencer is 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 to call it a block builder, essentially, right? Because what does a block builder do? A block builder builds a block, and what is that? It's just ordering a list of transactions, right? So, technically, you could say a sequencer is a block builder, right? But we know today that with PBS proposal builder separation, suddenly that might be confusing again because yes uh, we have block builders and then proposers but um and, and maybe the block builder in that pbs model is more the block builder than the proposers but ultimately the proposer is still the one who's ratifying the final ordering right that's the whole point so actually they're also a block builder because they are also have some influence over the ordering even though someone does the actual work of finding the optimal ordering extracting the most mev and sharing that 
um, still the proposer is the one who eventually, like who 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 is there to um, bring the consistency into the database and say, okay, this is the final state that I pick with my stake, right? And then you have attestors and so on. It, it's like it's a it's it's turtles all the way down, right? So so uh, so actually one thing I one unlock I recently had when looking at espresso and by the way like this is a technical podcast we don't we don't really care much so if you if you already lost at this point just make sure you you maybe pause here and re read the espresso docs and come back because it's gonna be quite technical here um, straight away so so anyways uh, one thing I realized with espresso is like mm, it's a shared sequencer then I was wondering, is it like a shared block builder? Then I saw that you guys are already basically thinking about PBS, right? Like I think when you when you when you refer to these entities right now that are actually um, buying block space from multiple rollups at the same time and then sort of building super blocks for them, right? These entities are probably sophisticated entities uh, that we know today, like the 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 Rsings, the the Beaver builds, and so on. Probably more like these type of entities. And and uh, and they run, you know, heavy algorithms, heavy machinery, and so on. They're probably fairly centralized. And and then you have the more decentralized part, like probably the Ethereum proposer said, if we talk about base sequencing, right? Who are now just taking these new form of blocks and and again ratifying them, finalizing them, and and yeah. But uh, like actually, Espresso then almost seems a bit more like a shared proposal. And I think you've even seen this this term where it's like. Um, yeah, like, can you maybe dig in a, a bit to these definitions? Yeah. Like how wrong am I? How right. right am I? How do you think about it? No, it's, I mean, uh, certainly the thing that you're the most right about is that it is confusing. And, <laughs> and uh, no, I, I, I want, you know, hopefully we can keep, uh, keep the listeners on. Um, I think, yeah, I guess the way that I think about uh a sequencer, I think it's it's exactly you know I think exactly like you said it's it's the person who gets to create the next uh, block for or create blocks for a rollup, um, and uh, you know sometimes it also does a, some more things like in a zk rollup it uh, might also you know do the proving part or in an optimistic rollup it might also you know sort of just uh, say this is the next stage and then play the fraud proof game um but the important thing is that you know the sequencer it can it can outsource tasks so for example it can outsource the task of building to a builder this is what we call proposer builder separation right um but that's just basically saying you know like i don't have to run everything on one machine you know it can outsource the proving to another machine right i can i can outsource tasks um what is espresso? I think this is the one thing you know that I um, and there we've. I feel like we've we've initially um, actually didn't do a great job at formulating this. Um, is that you know we sort of said espresso is a shared sequencer, but really, what does this mean? And you know, does this mean all the rollups that run on espresso have to give up the sequencing rights, and so on and so forth? Um, and I think this is the wrong way to think about it. What Espresso really is, it's a marketplace. Um, and it's a marketplace for rollups to sell their sequencing rights. So the sequencer can make some money. How does the sequencer make money? Well, it can charge transaction fees, it can determine the order of transactions, you know, it can make some money through that, maybe through MAV, uh, through different means. Um, you know, if you have a valuable rollup, then the sequencer can make some money. So rollups obviously don't want to give up. Uh, you know, the, the entirely give up the sequencing rights, or they should at least, you know, get some reward for it. And this is exactly what we built the marketplace for. So the espresso marketplace allows different rollups to sell their sequencing rights, and um, the the they sell it to the highest bidder. Um, and the big difference from so this is somewhat similar to PBS. Uh, proposal builder separation where also uh, uh, the, the the proposer you know, just kind of as you said it's kind of just another term for the sequencer sells the building rights of building the block, block uh, next block to a builder um, but there's two important differences so one of them is that uh, the PBS auction is sort of a just-in-time auction it happens you know 
exactly when I'm building, you know, the block. So it happens, you know, in the seconds where I'm building the block, versus the espresso marketplace sort of happens uh, ahead of time. It happens like say a day before or some period of before. And then the other big property differences, and this is where uh, the shared part comes in, is that I cannot just buy, you know, the rights for one rollup, but I can actually bid on or, or express that I want to buy multiple rollups at the same time. So uh, I can basically say, hey, I want to, you know, rollup A is worth 70 and rollup B is worth uh, 3 E, but together they're worth 15 E for me. Why would they be worth more? Well, because from shared sequencing, I can, you know, take advantage of arbitrage. I can enable, you know, faster bridging. I can satisfy user intent. I can make more money through uh, shared sequence. Um, and this is why I would be willing to pay more to basically sequence two rollups or more, multiple rollups at the same time. And the marketplace exactly allows you to, to, to express that and buy Multi, the sequencing rights for multiple rollups in the same period at the same time. Um, and this is how we enable shared sequencing. So we're not just running, you know, like we're not just running, you know, like one big server that does the shared sequencing for everybody. Uh, instead, we're saying basically rollups can sell their sequencing rights to uh, these shared shared proposals, shared sequences, shared builders, whatever you want to call them, um, uh, that, you know, that know how to take advantage of uh, cross rollup arbitrage, that know how to take, uh, you know, satisfy user intents, enable applications that work across rollups, and so on and so forth. Cool. Yeah, so that is the economic concept of this block space marketplace that you're building. It is essentially saying, hey, uh, we can, we have a system here where essentially rollups, rollup operators, right? And again, confuse me because they usually are called sequencers, but then there's again in a rollup, I guess here in Espresso, we have the concept of the rollup operator, which can now either sequence themselves or sell these rights to Espresso. So we have two levels of sequencing here. Mm -hmm. um, then espresso hotshot sequencer is is that new thing that didn't exist before and then we have um we have that that roll up sequence and now potentially we have also like for example the, the layer one that the roll up will always settle on right and that's another sequence because we know that technically what you're hoping for in a roll up with pre confirmations fast confirmations is that your se sequence that you committed to now will actually also be reflected in that same way on Ethereum later on, right? That's the whole point. So so technically, um, um, Ethereum is the, the final sequence here. It is sort of uh, the, the roll-up's future, right? Exactly. So this is a very good point. So uh, uh, there's two um, important uh, points here is that, you know, sort of these, these shared sequencers, you know, one of the, the great powers is that they, uh, they can give sort of cross rollup. They can give these pre-confirmations. So what they can do is they can tell you, they can promise you, you know, this transaction or these transactions will happen in this order. And then, you know, they can even like economically back up these promises. So they can say, if I don't do this, then I will get slashed. So these are so-called, uh, sometimes they're referred to as proposal promise pre-confirmation. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, basically it's just a promise, you know, that something will happen in this way and it's, it can be economically bad, backed. Um, the, uh, I think, yeah, I want to, I want to respond to two things. So first of all, you know, the rollup operator, um, when it sells the sequencing rights, it can still run, you know, its own centralized sequencer and it can basically say, well, you know, I'm only going to sell my sequencing rights if I make more than X, right? I know that I can make X on my own for a block. Uh, it can either say, you know, I'm always going to sell it and, and you know, the, the marketplace is competitive. So I know that I'll make enough money there. 
but you can also set a reserve price. So you can say, I'm only going to sell it if I make X. Um, and, uh, you know, this, then obviously sometimes you might not sell the sequencing rights and then you just sequence yourself. Um, that's okay as well. Uh, but you know, this basically guarantees like one of the main things that we want to guarantee at Espresso is that it's sort of basically rollups have no downside of joining the Espresso marketplace. It should be sort of a clear win. And why can it be a clear win? Why, why, you know, is there money to be made? Well, this is really because of this shared sequencing properties, because, you know, I can, the, 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 the sequencers get benefits from being able to be shared, shared sequencers and uh, rollups, you know, then also don't have to worry about their own sequencing, but even if they do, you know, they can, uh, it's very likely that they can sell their sequencing rights for more than they could have made on their own. Um, this is really, you know, this is like the core, core intuition for why this makes sense, right? Uh, so this is about, you know, sort of rollups, rollup operators running their own sequencer, which they can still do on the site, but basically, you know, sometimes or a lot of the times they will actually sell that right to sequence. And then, you know, for, for some epochs, uh, they, uh, maybe no one wants to buy their rollup, then they just sequence themselves. Okay, so that's regarding, you know, this rollup operator and, and the centralized sequencing. Uh, the, the other thing that you brought up is that in the end, you know, things get settled on Ethereum and they're really only finalized once you've settled them on Ethereum, right? Uh, the problem is with that is uh, that, so Ethereum is, is safe and, and great and, you know, it's, it's sort of, uh, especially after a certain time, it's very unlikely to fork and, and it has a lot of great properties. Uh, the problem with it is that um, it takes quite some time, you know, it might take quite some time to submit your block to Ethereum. So, you know, for a lot of long time where uh, the rollup is sort of in this intermediate state where with, you know, the, you've had a sequencer that, that build a bunch of blocks and uh but they haven't been pushed to ethereum yet and people maybe you know there's some uncertainty about whether those blocks will actually eventually get pushed to ethereum um and for that what we build is this uh so in order to 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 remedy this uh the second component of we build what we build so one component is this marketplace and the second thing is the so-called hotshot finality gadget so the finality gadget is run by a set of attester, so-called attester nodes, um, you know, to, to bring in more, uh, uh, slightly more jargon, um, but yeah, by just some set of nodes. So it's, a, it's essentially running, um, these can be restaked Ethereum nodes, um, but essentially it's a, it's a proof of stake consensus, but it's a very, very simple and fast one because all it does is it receives blocks from the sequencers and says, yes, I've seen this block in this order. And it basically gives them the stamp of approval. And after they've stamped the block, uh, the, the, the block and the block order cannot be changed anymore. Okay. So the hotshot stamps the block and hotshot, you know, stamps the block every couple of seconds. It's really, really fast, right? It doesn't execute the blocks. It's, you know, it doesn't, you know, verify any proofs. It doesn't execute any blocks. All it does, it says, this is the order of transactions. I've seen it. Um, and then what happens is, so this can be much, much faster than say the Ethereum consensus because it is, you know, it's really a dumb consensus. Um, but uh, uh, what happens then is that basically when you push the blocks to Ethereum, the Ethereum smart contract checks or was this block actually stamped by Hotshot? So did Hotshot, in fact, you know, stamp this block? Did you pu push it through the finality gadget? And if the answer is yes, then Ethereum will accept it. If no, then no. But what this, what this guarantees is that sort of the, if, you, if you trust the Hotshot finality gadget, uh, then you know, now you have uh, suddenly a much more secure pre-confirmation. So you can be much more... Uh, 
uh, you know, sort of the second something has got stamped by, by the hotshot finality gadget, you can essentially be sure that this is actually going to happen in this order and you don't need to necessarily wait for, like if you want the 100% security, then you should wait for Ethereum. But if you're okay with like 99.9% .9 security, then, um, you know, you can uh, just take this hotshot stamp block for granted. Cool, nice. That makes sense. I think it's a very interesting dynamic. There's certainly a network effect here, right? Like um, it, it is this interest, interesting dynamic where you want parties, roll-up operators that normally are in competition with each other, definitely, right? Some of them might even hate each other, um, right? You, you want them to join this shared system. And I mean, this this is like this happened before many times, right? Like for example, in, in finance in the banking world, um, you have all sorts of federated systems, and I mean, or, or common like a very known one is Visa, right? Where you had the same problem where I think Bank of America was 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 basically trying to to get their competitors to join the system for the merits it had, which were like um, you know um, faster transactions. Uh, not having all of these, like whatever was before Visa, like the, the, they had some weird systems there, like uh, I forgot the name of it, but it was basically Stone Ages compared to what Visa achieved, right? And Visa worked mm -hmm. because because the benefits of joining the systems outweighed the competitive forces that these guys had between each other, right? So so essentially, the Espresso is like saying, okay, um, all everyone should like sort of join this, um, for for the mutual benefit that they can get, and the more people join this, the more MEV opportunities you have, and so on, and the more of this value can be shared back with with rollup users and operators, and so on. Right? Like that's that's the idea. Yeah, I think this is a very very good point, and I think that um, yeah, I think that there's you know obviously uh, you, you exactly hit it hit uh, it uh, the nail on the head that you know there are like shared sequencing benefits are bigger and better the more uh you know rollups participate and i think that uh the way that you know we try to achieve this is through uh two important avenues which is first of all um we want to be you know very neutral um like we don't you know uh we want to you know sort of work with all of the technology stacks all of the you know all different kinds of roll-ups you know we're really you know we don't pick favorites we're not you know uh we're certainly not building a roll-up on our own right uh you know we want to work with uh you know all the partners and you saw this in our, our latest announcement uh you know in, in in the race we you know got sort of a lot of strategic investments from you know uh gelato and other you know but also like uh, you know bigger roll-up stacks and, and you know, bridge partners and, and so on and so forth and um uh yeah i mean i think we're very transparent there that uh the goal is to you know build a big tent uh and get everybody um uh underneath it and um uh yeah and i think you know sort of working with uh, RAS operators uh, like Gelato that make it, you know, easy for rollups to join this, right, is, is another huge component, right? I think that, you know, there's a lot of technical terms and, you know, technical jargon, but, you know, in the end of the day, like, what's really important is that, you know, a lot of applications, a lot of app developers, uh, you know, they know and they figured out that the way to scale the application is to run it as a rollup, but, you know, that has to be made as easy as possible. Right. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're not going to unlock the next set of applications. Right. We cannot. This is not, you know, how we drive the future of blockchains. The other thing I think that um, is important that we do is that the way that we design the product and the way that we design the marketplace, it should be, you know, as I already mentioned, it should essentially be a no brainer. To join. Like we're not trying to say. You know, like one one way we could have designed the uh, you know project is like, oh, you know, we're just running a shared sequencer or something like this, and you know, then we get all of the 
revenue from the shared sequencer uh, goes to, I don't know, espresso or something like that. But, you know, who would join that, right? Like there's, you know, this is like just saying the roll-ups are giving up all of, all of the all of the revenue and this just doesn't really make sense, right? Um, uh, so what we're saying is basically the way that we design the marketplace is that you should be better off than you would be on your own. Uh, and because of the network effects, this can actually be the case, right? uh this because of the shared sequencing benefits what we're saying is that you know you get like in this marketplace you you get uh at least sort of what you would have made on your own uh and then maybe you get even a little bit more from the shared sequencing benefits and you know there might be some small fee but you know that sort of is, is so small that uh it's um uh it's outweighed by the shared sequencing benefits and the way that you can ensure it is that basically you set your own price um, you know, you say like, I'm only going to participate in this marketplace if uh, I get at least X, you know? Um, and so it's a very like, you know, even after you've joined the system, you're not, you know, like, uh, you know, it's a sort of very light, like, uh, or sort of the, the economic integration is such that, um, you know, you're, you're, uh, you can still be sure that you're making enough uh, more money than you would have made on your own. Um, and that's, yeah, that's how we designed it in order to sort of like network effects, you know, are sometimes viewed as, I don't know, sometimes viewed as evil, sometimes viewed as good, but like, you know, here, like the idea is that everybody can be better off if we work together. Right. And um, yeah, of course, you know, like uh, we're trying to, to, uh, get everybody together under the espresso tent. Um, and the reason is that, you know, we just think this, I mean, like, yeah, the main reason is that we think this would be better for everybody involved, but of course, yeah, it would also be better for espresso. <laughs> everybody is under the espresso tent. Yeah. Cool. And, and I think here is one perspective where I usually then struggle and where I get, get a bit stuck. Um, and this is the perspective of, of the user, and here I'm using user in the broad sense, as in mm -hmm. MEV searchers, block builders, or actual end users who want mm -hmm. features. And here, I like to think of end users as people, uh, like users who are yeah. ultimately completely unaware of the underlying tech, which is currently yeah. in crypto, we're in this weird, weird stadium where somehow people identify as a Arbitrum user or as a um, mantle user or whatever, right? It's so weird. Like that's like saying, "Hey, I am this Linux server on AWS East, whatever." Right? Like no one does that when they use apps in Web two, but somehow right now we as users basically specify the instance of a server that we're using instead of like the application, really. All right. So so that's still like in this early stage that we're in. And like when I say user, I mean ultimately someone who's just using an app. They have no clue what's going on underneath. That's the way it should be. And and there you have a developer who is another user who is maybe using uh, Espresso Hotshot Sequencer um, to be able to build an application, to be able to make available available certain transaction types to their users, right? Like, for example, maybe, I don't know, executing a trade on two or three different rollups for best execution or purchasing assets from all different sorts of rollups in one wallet interface and so on, like these sort of things. So where I struggle a bit when looking at Espresso is there's these two ways of approaching it. And I think the dominant approach is the sort of Ethereum MEV style approach where we go from, from, the, from the bottom and we say, hey, um, yes, looking at all of this block space, there's MEV opportunities, right? Um, what is the feature here? It's atomic execution. Um, and that is usually a feature that um, arbitrageurs want or something, right? Like, because it gives them a lot of um, risk reduction or even risk-free ways of executing arbitrages across these different domains, right? And actually, in I mean, first of all, like, does, like, arbitrageurs in traditional finance, do they even have this luxury? Like, I, I think a lot of them have probably 
um, like what you call stat arb, right, right, which is like they cannot atomically execute between two, like the NASDAQ and NYSE, right? Like this doesn't exist there, right? Like, I mean, I know there's all sorts of crazy tricks high frequency traders do. They've hacked these systems sort of to be able to do that. But the systems certainly weren't designed with that in mind, whereas Espresso is explicitly designed with that in mind to enable atomic execution across across disparate systems who are, who are operated by, by entities, disparate entities who might even be in different jurisdictions and so on. Right. Like, so it, it's this sort of technology there. But but like um, this is this makes sense. Right. Like, sure, you can say, hey, we are all creating this block space. We're leaving a lot of money on the table. Let's get these sophisticated shops in. Let's get them to harvest this money for us, and let's build a system, a marketplace where they are, uh, where the, where they have to pay it back to us, so we can pocket it or give it to our users. Sounds like a good win-win, right? Like this, this is efficient. Um, but then when you think the other way around, right? Like. And, and like just because what you mentioned there, what I hear a lot in Espresso's talks and the documentation is like, yeah, but the roll-up is it's like sort of block by block. You can decide whether you want that or not. Like maybe I'm just going to sequence this block myself. I'm not going to outsource it to like one of these uh, hedge funds or whatever, right? Um, that makes sense in that model. But on the other model, like the other model, what we have with, with Espresso is like Espresso is not just this, right? Like just on the merits of MEV alone, like maybe to be honest, it could be enough, right? To justify building this. Uh, but there's also the promise of other end user oriented features. Right? Not, now we're not talking about arbitrageurs, traders, um, high frequency traders, whatnot, right? Like now we're talking about people, first of all, application developers who want to build great apps and then their users, right? And what are the examples here, right? Like, for example, I think the most obvious one to me is just bridging. Nowadays, what I see a lot of times, and obviously Gelato is a roll up as a service platform, and we we launch a bunch of chains into production. And one of the things early on that I realized about rollups, which made me a bit more bearish on rollups and like a bit more bullish on like sovereign chains or whatnot, or even side chains again. And like I'm not 100% serious here, but I often saw that people don't want to use the rollup bridge, uh, right? Because um, I mean, especially in optimistic rollups because of the seven day withdrawal period, but also other reasons. The rollup bridge today, and, and, and here my, the issue is like, Probably the biggest invention of the rollup is the rollup bridge, right? Like the, the mm -hmm. whole point. The whole point is to put your assets into the rollup bridge on Ethereum, and then to have a, a, this L2 off-chain execution engine um, modify the state that is pertaining to these assets and modify the balances, and for you to be able to to get out of there if if some 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 protocol was not actually correctly followed on the L2 by the operator, right? So. The, the like for me the rollup bridge is a very important feature right like if you have a rollup and it doesn't use the rollup bridge at all which means none of the rollup assets are canonically issued by the technology um that we we sort of agreed to use but rather by a third party provider like let's say layer zero stargate across and so on right um then you lose a lot of benefits of this technology right like at this point it's like yes you still have a blockchain it's still running and so on but you don't really use like you don't really use the 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 blockchain technology to its fullest potential, which is like basically having the fraud proofs and so on, right? Having zk proofs uh, and having the roll up sort of be able to arbitrate over the state and the assets in the bridge. Um, so there, like I think one of the cool things about Espresso is I I, I haven't fully defined this yet, but I could see this as like. Uh, supercharging roller bridging again because one of the biggest issues is not the, just this bi-directional bridge from Ethereum to the roll-up, right? Because I actually call it unidirectional in the optimistic roll-up case because no one is actually waiting seven days, right? Like no user in this world. So actually it's just Ethereum to the roll-up. Technically it's bi-directional. You can also go back, but you know, uh, as, uh, like ZK roll-ups are sort of there, but you know, they're also not really working that well yet. But but yeah, so this is the problem is it doesn't end there. Even if you have a ZK rollup, you know, you still only this bi-directional bridge doesn't cut it. If we like at Gelato, we believe in a world of thousands of hundreds of thousands of rollups over the years. I'm sure Espresso does as well. Um, then you really want this rollup to rollup connection, right? And that's like the crooks. Like a lot of people nowadays, they want to go from base to their rollup and not necessarily from Ethereum to their rollup, right? Um, so. So I think here, like I see this, like one of the key features that Espresso can deliver, it, it can make the roller bridge technology much uh, easier to proliferate again by virtue of standardizing it, by virtue of multiple mm -hmm. protocols opting into it, 
and that's like a clear feature because now we can actually have seamless bridging between rollups um, uh, without having to trust third-party bridges and so on. Uh, nothing against them. They're all doing a great job helping the space. But, you know, you, you definitely lose a lot of the rollup benefit if you just end up using a third-party bridge. That's just the way it is. Unless that bridge is a liquidity provider who is literally working with the canonical assets, allowing fast entries yeah. and exit, they are still underneath using the rollup bridge. That's great, right? If we talk about a mint and burn model where they're just the asset issuer completely sidestepping the roller bridge, then we have a bit of a problem because the roller bridge at this point is not being utilized and you're probably now gaining like, I don't know, 10% of what the roll-up is worth for maybe less, right? So 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 yeah, um, that's for me like the biggest first feature that I can clearly see that I'm most excited about with Espresso Shared Sequencing, but there's others, right? Like, and, and you soon, then you can get a bit like hand wavy and it's like, yeah, like a flash loan. Oh yeah. But then very quickly you realize how complex this is and then you're wondering, okay, flash loans are great, but are they worth all of this complexity or can we live without them? And maybe we can live without them, right? Um, so, so, and there's, yeah, so, but, but like the, the problem I have with this user perspective, other than with the bridging, which is pretty clear to me is on the MEV perspective, it's obvious, right? MEV already happens today between Ethereum, between not just chains, like also sex, dex, arbitrage and so on, right? Stat ARP exists today. We have actors who are willing to take asynchronous non-atomic risks and who are willing to ARP between these, these places. And th that's actually somewhat efficient. Uh, but um, but yeah, so actually the, the problem there is these actors, they can observe these systems and the systems don't have to be aware of them, right? Like they have their own balance sheet and they can move flows between the systems without the systems themselves sort of bottom up being aware of these actors. Espresso is a bit different because Espresso actually wants to level up here and make the system sort of be operated by these actors even to give them guarantees of atomic ex execution, right? And that... That should be the, the sort of uh, holy grail for an arbitrageur and MEV border and so on. So the, 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 there it makes sense. But like I feel like from the other way around, when we have these user features, it gets super complex because how would you build an application? Like, like from the MEV bot, it's clear. If you get the block space, if you can include your trades, sure, awesome, right? But from a user's and application developer's perspective, are you now building an application across different rollups that aren't even operated by you? Like they're just operated by someone else? Like, like how does the smart contract look like? Do we ha now need a new compiler, a new language and so on to make the smart contract aware of these different domains? Um, uh, is it gonna be transaction-based? Cause like a transaction in Ethereum currently cannot really do this. It cannot really span across different domains, right? Unless you sort of abstract it or is it like intent-based? Um, uh, how is the application going to be built, right? Like, are, are users, uh, how, are, where are users submitting their stuff to? Are they going to talk to an API from their application? Like, are you going to, let's say, if, uh, let's say we have an on-chain Binance, right? And that's using this. Um, and it's sort of aggregating liquidity from three different rollups. Are users interfacing here, like, say, are they saying, okay, I want to execute this trade and I want to execute it here, here, and here, right? That sounds hella complex, right? Like, surely there's some server doing that on behalf of the user. Um, yeah, but 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 how how do like I think this world is a, for me a bit harder to envision because it seems like there's a right now Ethereum just looks very different than what this world assumes it will look like on the application building side. Yeah, sorry, long, uh, long rant here, but, but yeah. <laughs> no, this is yeah, great. You know, we should have you as uh, you know these are exactly the, the the perfect product questions to ask, and I think sort of I think you essentially hit it like. I think you, you essentially got it that there is kind of two sides to the stories. There is the, you know, sort of the block building side and uh, then there's the end user side and, you know, the benefits of it will be um, sort of different things uh, initially. And, and uh, you know, and then there's sort of this, this vision of, of bringing things, you know, together and, and uh, you know, a little bit more the, the far out applications. Um, but let's talk about exactly the um, the end users, because I think it's really important, you know, to to, you know, sort of ensure that this isn't just a product for, you know, arbitrageurs. Um, and, you know, I think that like, sometimes arbitrageurs is, is like viewed as something evil. But as you already pointed out, it, it is actually economically efficient, right? Like, you know, if they can bring the price, say, you know, I have a DEX on my rollup and uh, the price of Ethereum is way too low, 
a way to high, you know, they basically they lower the they lower the um, the ask the bid ask spreads um, and so on by doing that. And uh, you know, the less risk they have to take, the the sort of the tighter the the, the spreads will get, um, which just makes it a more efficient system for everybody. But you know, this is the one side. I think it is really important to also focus on, you know, in the end, we want end users, right? Like we want end users who have a seeming seamless experience, who don't give a crap about, you know, whatever sequencer, plot, technology, jargon is underneath there, who just actually want to use the system, who want to buy some NFTs somewhere, you want to, you know, like, um, yeah, like play some game on the blockchain, do whatever, right? Um, and hopefully, you know, there's much more of those uh, in the future. Uh, like, I really personally care about that. Um, there, I think the first thing that we're starting with is exactly what you said. So we've we've had this uh, this demo uh, where we partnered with Across, which is exactly a liquidity provider bridge. Um, so you know, you don't. Uh, like you can bridge, I think USDT, um, and uh, yeah, they they liquidity providers, so you don't get some wrapped asset. You actually get the real asset, um, sort of, uh, yeah, uh, sort of sent across, um, you know, two different rollups. And so, what are they? So, how are we partnering with them on a technical level? Well, you know, right now they wait until the block is posted to Ethereum because they want to be sure that the block doesn't change anymore. They want to be sure that in fact, you know, this block is, is finalized and then they release the funds on the other chain. Um, and what they do is that if basically what we demonstrated with them is that if a roll up uses Espresso, then they are happy to basically take the hotshot finalization stamp as you know uh, as a, um, you know as a sort of sign that this block will actually appear in this order, and then they can do the execution. You know they don't have to wait seven days for fraud proofs because they can just execute the blocks themselves. They know exactly in what order it's going to appear, and they know whether the money has been deposited to the bridge. And if it's signed by Hotshot, they also know the order. So there's no more risk for them. Uh, and they can immediately then release those funds in seconds rather than days. And, um, you know, even today, there's some bridges that take a short amount of time, but then they charge higher fees because they, it basically is like either you reduce the time while staying at the same risk or you reduce the risk uh, while. Uh, staying at the same time. So it makes it significantly easier for, for liquidity bridges um, to operate because, um, you know, now just there's just almost essentially no risk once a block has been stamped by, by a hotshot. Um, and the very nice thing about this, what I really like about this, is that it's from an integration point of view, it's what needs to happen. Well, the bridge needs to uh, be aware of hotshots. It needs to run some hotshot node. Uh, it needs to run, you know, this espresso node. Sort of, it needs to check the 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 the, um, the hotshot finalization stamp. That's very easy. That's some code. And then it just essentially needs to change its parameters based on that, right? It just needs to release the funds sooner. That's it. Right, that's all that needs to happen. There's no big technological change that needs to happen here. And for the user, really nothing changes, right? All basically that happens is that they use a cross um, uh, and suddenly their funds get released much faster. Um, and I think that these kinds of applications where we're going to work with liquidity providers, uh, um, you know, uh, in order to to enable you know this this uh, really sort of fast native uh, liquidity bridging you know I think uh, one um, uh, uh, this is like going to be sort of the first wave of like utility for uh, rollups and end users um, that's you know has kind of the nice features of on a technical level 
it's really simple. Like there's nothing, you know, too fancy happening, no fancy, crazy, fresh loan, pre-confirmation, whatever, right? It's just a faster bridge. But I think the impact of it is actually going to be quite huge. Yeah, I, I'm actually very, uh, very interested in that. And and to be honest, we could end here. I think like, let's say Espresso fulfills its vision of becoming, um, basically, first of all, what, what, what our picture are we painting? We are saying that thanks to Ethereum's roll-up centric roadmap, but also others, right? Like Celestia Cosmos roll-ups and, and so on. Uh, we will have a world that is, basically using many different blockchain standards and a blockchain consists of many different things and we will have many different VMs. But ultimately a blockchain is just an ordered list of transactions, right? And um, if we don't have something like Espresso, we will just have a shit ton of silos of ordered lists of transactions. And we will, I mean, going back to one of the key points that you want to solve for is like liquidity fragmentation and also barriers between these silos and espresso is essentially in part helping with liquidity fragmentation we can talk a bit more about that because that's obviously the hardest not to crack but it's especially making these systems interoperate more with each other right and a key party is just bridging and i think if espresso just allows like let's, let's say the future of 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 finance and, and uh, France and, and whatnot and many other things are built on chain, right? On these roll-ups, which obviously at Gelato we are heavily invested in and believe in and we want to usher usher about that future by by essentially building infrastructure services to to produce blocks in block space in, 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 like in a very easy manner. But yeah, let's say you believe in that, then this should take over and the future NASDAQs, the future New York Stock Exchanges, the future... Um, art galleries, uh, the future Ebays, whatever it is, right? Uh, the future bond markets um, and so on and so on. They will all run um, and be represented as ordered list of transactions that are blockchains, right? And and that like Espresso will just help efficient, like with efficiency between these systems, it will help actors make markets and arbitrage between these systems, which we already see is happening in the financial world today between exchanges and so on, right? Uh, on a global scale even. Um, and it will do so with technology, um, with, with elegant technology, um, more so than with, I don't know, um, all, all these weird tricks that had like high frequency traders pull uh, and then regulators come in and try to solve it. And it's just like a game of whack-a-mole, right? Uh, so it will do so with a essentially with a well-defined protocol like the, the espresso protocol that is that is interoperating and and enshrined in all the other protocols so uh, and that is opt-in and so on it's it's it, it's like yeah i think that's great and and achieving this for efficiency reasons and also for letting these systems interoperate and bridge assets um without without always um, losing the benefit of these systems, which is cryptographic security in the first place, right? And crypto economic security, that's that's already great. And then if you achieve that, to be honest, like the project is already a ma major success, I think. And now beyond this, we can now talk about more long tail use cases like actual application developers. Like actually, I think, to be honest, it sometimes doesn't even, like talking about the end user is confusing because they should never go and say, I... I'm like clicking a button, like imagine how horrible the UI would look to this. Like you would first have to explore all of the assets on all of these different chains and you would ha then have to collect them sort of and and uh, create, essentially create a transaction to to um, transact with them on these different domains. Now, obviously this should be abstracted from the end user by the developer. So the, the, the real user here is maybe the developer that can now build applications that span across multiple domains and uh, and and I mean, they can somewhat do this today already with layer zero and so on if layer zero supports these different chains, right? Like I think one cool thing about Espresso is that it is a permissionless system, at least it seems to be. So it's more like, okay, you don't have to ask layer zero or someone else to enable a new chain and pay them a lot for it or so, right? Like it's more like, um, okay, these chains have, like they already can opt into Espresso and that's that's that, right? Like you still need someone to enable espresso, but that, that's that. From that moment out, 
like um you know uh I, I mean maybe that's somewhat similar to enabling layer zero but but it seems easier because the protocol is very well defined and so on it's just like it's, it's essentially what espresso is it's just a, a list of list of transactions right so it's a very simple technology in that sense and uh and it's the the core essence of a blockchain and actually at this point here like it seems also to be very technically like very agnostic right like it's to whether it's evm or not because all blockchain is just li order list of transactions whether they're solana whether they're aptos evms and so on they're just listing transactions and then the execution is just a way to process these transactions and to execute the straight transaction function right and whether you can do it parallel or not in parallel is the difference between svm and monad evm and evm and, and whether you do it in a more object oriented way or whatnot is like these are like differences of these vms these platforms but ultimately they all look at an ordered list of transactions right so so in that sense like espresso seems to be this unifying glue where it's like a a blockchain of blockchains right um and yeah so that's a long rant again but it seems like this nice permissionless way of of organizing blockchain lists where if if you have this network and if the more rollups opt in like you can now have developers if they want to uh build applications that span across these these things but i still I mean, struggle i still struggle somewhat sometimes seeing like the, these like other than an application that literally does arbitrage across these chains that allows users to do it which is a bit weird because normally you would have an arbitrager be more like operate in private right but uh, but but yeah, um, and or maybe a one-inch aggregator, right? That that definitely is a multi-chain application, right? Like a one-inch aggregator, cross-chain swaps, and so on. Like th these things, they are like they're pretty obvious, and maybe that's already enough as well. Maybe we don't need more, right? But I think at some point, I see that there's like it's just easier to just build your app as a singleton, sort of like you know become the biggest perp dex, try to attract all of the liquidity. Yes, Espresso will still make it easier for your users to go in from all sorts of places and with, with secure bridging and so on. But at some point, I think uh, we also have to acknowledge that most apps probably won't be as complex as spanning across multiple domains. A lot of apps will just be in their domain. They will still use Espresso somehow for bridging maybe, or maybe because they want to get MEV from shared sequencing. Uh, but but yeah, there's definitely, these apps will have their, 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 their right to exist as well. And, and there's no... There's many use cases where you don't need to span across multiple domains. Would, would you say that's that's true, roughly speaking? Um, uh, I have you know a, a couple of points. So I think you know like one way to to look at espresso is it's sort of like the the you know a bit of a virtualization layer. You know, like it's like uh, the the VMware. You know, like where you know we provide some some resources, or it allows these rollups to operate sort of independently. You know, run different applications. They can look. You're exactly right that we try to be sort of a very minimal, uh, minimal layer. Um, you know, very agnostic to how the actual execution works, but still allow rollups to use kind of shared resources. Um, uh, you know, sort of the shared sequencing is sort of this the shared resource of of ordering. Um, the other thing is that you know you're talking about like sort of what is you know like what does uh, you know, a shared sequencing app look like essentially, right? Like what does an app look up look like that that spans uh, multiple rollups? And I think one really interesting direction that uh, we've been looking at is uh, looking at what uh, Polygon is doing with AgLayer. Um, and there essentially what AgLayer enables is through, you know, recursive proving and through ZK proof techniques that um, you can, pass messages within the block building between different rollups. So, uh, you know, message passing allows, you know, like basically, yeah, one application sends some message to another application and you can actually prove that, you know, all the in and outgoing messages are, are consistent with each other. Um, but AgLayer Ag Layer is, is sort of a proving protocol and we're actually, you know, we're, we're um, uh, you know, you could uh, sort of see that uh, 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 Polygon, you know, was also an investor in, in our latest uh, rounds. And uh, we're very actively working with Polygon and exploring on how to combine uh, Eclair with, uh, with sort of Espresso and the Espresso marketplace 
because um, you know the the marketplace would you allow you then to uh, to to basically you know have multiple rollups you know be built by multiple polygon rollups be built by the same shared sequencer. Um, which can then use the act layer technology. Like basically act layer makes shared sequencing more valuable um, because with act layer, I can then pass messages between applications that run on two uh, Polygon CDK chains. Um, uh, and, you know, by that, like what is message passing? Well, it's just, you know, a fancy way of saying that, you know, like you can, you can uh, synchronously, like you can call another smart contract. I can, for example, say, you know, I'm going to call another smart a function in another smart contract, right? And uh, this, I think, you know, again, this is a little bit further out, but I think this is kind of, you know, one of the possible uh, uh, um, this would uh, uh, be basically the the um, way to enable the you know some of these shared applications uh, across multiple chains. Cool. Yeah. And and I mean, I'm I'm not sure if uh, today, like like I told you before the podcast, I feel like we have a lot to talk about. Espresso is like this crazy mental unlock and universe and and maybe we we will have a part two because uh, you know we could go on forever now talking about base sequencing and so on but, but i think we still have 15 minutes or so so uh, so let's try at least to unpack a little bit more um yeah so okay um actually this you br brought up something interesting uh which is egg layer and so on also exist right and there are like there are these other interop system which are mostly in asynchronous in nature and i think maybe this is also how the web works in general today is mostly in asynchronous right and part of the cool thing about ethereum and, and solana is like this sort of synchronous atomic execution and um, espresso is trying to bring this back into a asynchronous many rollups world which is is it's mm -hmm. always going to be asynchronous espresso is just a way to abstract away this asynchronicity and turn it back into synchronicity right um exactly yeah yes so so um uh, and we know that there's a certain class of things where that are like atomic arbitrage and so on that are simply like not possible without the synchronicity guarantees um and and beyond that uh, even even if you could get by with a more asynchronous system, surely sometimes synchronicity is also just nice, like elegant, um, um, sort of, um, yeah. So for bridging and so on. Um, so one question I have is like sometimes I see atomic inclusion versus atomic execution, right? Atomic inclusion is the idea that. Um, I think this was early on in shared sequencing, probably like a year ago, where you guys arrived at is like, okay, we can give atomic inclusion guarantees. Uh, but like, I, I don't understand, is that valuable at all, atomic inclusion, or is it always atomic execution, right? Because atomic inclusion means, okay, you can you can get your transactions included, but you don't know if they will actually execute. And And I think normally what you want is you want your transactions to be included and also execute, because if they revert, by definition, they're almost basically not included because if your transaction is included but doesn't do anything because it reverts, right? Then it's almost like it's not included. Like, that's how I think about it. So, would you be fair? Say, would you say it's fair to say we should basically forget about atomic inclusion? It's just like an intermediate step that helps, and it's really all about atomic ex execution. Yeah, I think it's an, an intermediate step. I think uh, essentially that's exactly right. Uh, I think atomic inclusion can uh, sort of help the sequencer itself like there's you know some cases where it helps the sequencer itself that basically no one can rip apart the block anymore um you know that's that's uh, kind of an important property uh sometimes but uh yeah i think it's in the end it's about atomic execution um uh i think that's uh, you know where where the real use cases are um and uh yeah i think Essentially, you know, and, and sort of our model of, of of the marketplace and the way that we talk about shared sequencing now is, is much more in line with that, where, you know, you have a shared sequencer that can give atomic execution guarantees and can give 
pre-confirmation guarantees and uh, yeah, hundred percent. Cool. And just to unpack a bit, like the scalability benefits that we we get from this, like for me, uh, espresso is a further step in the modular revolution that we're seeing, right? So what has happened? Um, people have separated, like early on in Ethereum rollups, uh, sort of uh, history. Um, what people have done is they've separated execution from um, consensus and data availability, right? So Ethereum today still does data availability and consensus of ordering of transactions, right? But execution is now happening on the rollup. That's sort of the idea. And what Espresso is doing, and to me, that's to be also, also to be honest, very similar to what Celestia is doing and other DA layers, right? Like, mm -hmm. is essentially saying, okay, um, we've also now separate DA and consensus uh, away from Ethereum. So we have Ethereum, which is essentially just doing, um, I guess, finality at this point or, or, or something like this, like finalization. We have, and we have this fast past version of Ethereum, which is Espresso Hot Shot, uh, and all the rollups, which is like uh, which is doing the the DA and consensus of ordering, and and then we have the rollups themselves, which are still doing execution. So you mentioned earlier at the very beginning of the podcast that it's like, um, okay, we're now actually putting this consensus in front, right? Like so, it's like Hot Shot itself just sees lists of transactions they are ordered it doesn't actually execute them right like otherwise it, we would be back to ethereum slowness because the reason the reason ethereum is so slow is because it's trying it's not only ordering but it's also executing at the same time and it needs every node in the network to do that right and that's why it's so slow mm. whereas in it's a, you know one 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 important thing this is i think people don't really realize this is that if you want to execute all the transactions then every node needs to have all of the transactions mm. this is you know sort of Seems like an obvious statement, but if you only need to agree on the ordering of the transactions, um, you can actually agree on the ordering using, say, for example, hashes of transactions or, or uh, you yeah. know, just just blocks, like just a commitment to the transaction. And then what you need is you basically nodes just need to be aware that the data is available. They don't actually need to have it. They need to just ensure that it is recoverable. So. Uh, you know, I think that basically Ethereum uses, like it gives you data availability, but it basically gives it by broadcasting the data to everybody. And the way that uh, this is done in Espresso, which is actually very similar to, to, to you know, how EigenDA works, is that the data is, is sort of split and shared amongst the nodes. So every node does not, at least, you know, sort of in real time, it doesn't have access to all of the data, it just gets its share of the data. And um, uh, so, you know, this is using like bank sharding techniques. It's this, yeah. just the same sharding. same techniques as the sharding. You can basically shard the data, um, but in order to do that, it's really important that you don't execute. Um, or like this only works if you don't want to execute. Um, because if you want to execute, then you need to actually um, get the full have data. The entire, get the full data. And, you know, this can also massively like, you might say like, oh, is execution really that expensive? You know, what if everybody has faster hardware? Uh, well, like, yeah, the other part that's really expensive is, is just sending the data to everybody. And we don't actually need to do that, at least not in real time. Yeah. And this is a, a basic sort of computer science concept here, which is like in Ethereum, the way it, it operates and is written today, adding a new node to the network doesn't gain you any performance at all. If anything, it, it worsens it, right? Uh, whereas in these systems like Espresso and apparently also EigenDA, it's a, it's a sharded system where adding a new node actually does help um, with performance and, and load, I guess, on the network, right? So you actually scale up with a new node, um, mm -hmm. sort of, I guess. But but yeah, so um, so basically, so what have we done now here? This is like hyper modularization of the stack, right? And the way I would describe it is Espresso allows for uh, it's just sequencing of transactions in the most performant manner in the decentralized network still, right? And um, and then you, you still have execution in front, right? Like someone still like, for example, ultimately we know that PBS already exists in Espresso today, right? Like actually I think of Espresso more of a shared proposal system like in Ethereum where you have a decentralized network of Espresso nodes proposing these blocks onto the Espresso blockchain, right? 
but actually there's a block builder somewhere, right? And that block builder is actually doing the actual sequencing because they're trying to extract MEV. They're trying to find the most optimal orders um, to go onto the final blockchain to, to, to extract that value. Um, and, uh, and these block builders, I mean, they have to execute, right? Otherwise they wouldn't even know what to do. They would be blind, right? So, and then these block builders now, the cool thing is they don't have to be decentralized. They can be super beefy servers and so on. They're not, they don't have to be networked. Uh, so we gain all of the scalability benefits of centralized systems here. We put this in front, we put decentralized, uh, consensus again in between. Now we already have a blockchain, which is this weird sort of commitment to the future of ethereum and now this also finds its way on ethereum and based on how paranoid you are you can decide at which stage in this pipeline you can consider the state final and trusted you can wait all all until the very end to ethereum then you haven't really gained that much in terms of speed but you have gained the benefits of shared sequencing like mev and so on uh, or you can even just take the espresso pre-confirmation thing, right? With uh, with staking and so on. And then you can also have the speed benefit of a roll-up. Because, uh, yeah, the, 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 let's not forget, like we're not just here for shared sequencing. We're also still here for the benefits of roll-ups, which is working around the speed limits of a decentralized slow network like Ethereum and pretending as if Ethereum is faster than that. Uh, yeah, is that, a, is that, well, does that, that all make sense? What I just said, is that how you think about it as well? Or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you should, uh, you know, uh, if you want to become a marketing officer, you know, like uh, <laughs> we I can, mean, uh, you know, uh, give you give you an opportunity uh, for that. You know, um, no, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, this is a is a is a great summary and and exactly right. Like, uh, I think that roll ups, you know, at the end of the day, that they they sort of scale um, uh, Ethereum by sort of. Uh, you know, they scale it horizontally and, and um, you know, they, they basically say, you know, we can have different execution engines, you know, that even as you said before, they can even look completely different. And uh, um, yeah, Espresso is, is providing this sort of like very lightweight layer underneath them that still in app enables sort of faster asynchrony that almost looks like synchrony in some, uh, some situations. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, so we can we can wrap up now. So so I was touching on this. So let let me get a bit uh, like um, you know a bit woo wooey here, which is uh, so sometimes I like to listen to physics physics books and so on. And one thing that struck me a bit with espresso is so I think um, Max Techmark, for example, like in this book Mathematical Universe, he said that like sometimes the way you can think of the universe and space time and so on is like actually it's not like this um um you know it's it's it basically all already happened is like one theory right and the way to think of of our observer moment like our our place in this universe is okay we are like like on a cd rom disk right like if you know how disk mm -hmm. roughly works or like mm -hmm. we're here on the disk and then the time is just like our way across this disk but it's basically all already written right the anal mm -hmm. analogy here that I'm going to draw to Espresso isn't perfect, but what I like the mental eye lock unlock I had recently when looking at Espresso is actually what Ethereum does today is it's always looking into the past. It's looking at the past blockchain. It's looking at the different competing versions that want to become the future. And then it's just saying, okay, let's all agree that this is now the canonical version and let's make this our future. But it's always like backward looking, right? Um, mm -hmm. For me, espresso sort of flips this on its head. I mean, no, not just espresso roll-ups in general, but espresso in a very funny way, especially we haven't talked about that today. We don't have time anymore, but base sequencing and so on, right? Like using the Ethereum validator yeah. set. Uh, so maybe the maybe for listeners, it's a bit like like it would be cooler if we had defined base sequencing as well. But essentially, roughly speaking, base sequencing is just using the Ethereum validator validata set to issue pre-confirmation. So the Ethereum validator set is now also making ethereum part of the espresso system if you will right ethereum block yeah. space is now also being auctioned off as part of the espresso system which is a bit harder to reason about because roll-up operators are usually centralized single sequencer entities so it's much easier to coordinate with them versus ethereum is this decentralized network of un anonymous validators right so the way that we I, I do actually want to touch on this a little bit okay so let's do i mean i have exactly, some more time you know, by the way yeah, like, yeah i have some uh, more time so we can go longer like I hope the, the listeners do too. Um, the, uh, 
the way that we enable so base sequencing exactly as you said sort of you know one 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 way to think about it is that uh you know the i think it uh, ideally uh for base sequencing you you want to also have the same interoperability that you have between say rollups that run on espresso also with the l1 with the ethereum l1 and one way to enable this is if the l1 proposer you know at a certain time slot so you know you always have a different l1 proposer essentially the l1 sequencer um uh you know which which rotates if that one becomes uh the sequencer for all the rollups so how do we enable that we have a you know pretty concrete plan of how we enable that well what we're saying is that what if the l1 proposer would just buy the rights in uh the auction uh, in 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 our marketplace. So, what if the L1 proposer becomes the the sequencer also for all of these rollups? And uh, in fact, this is almost essentially what we do. What we say is basically, you run you know this marketplace, you run this auction, or we in fact run a run a lottery. Um, uh, but basically, we run this lottery, and then the L1 proposer, which Sort of, you know, you know, there's some look ahead, so you know beforehand whether you're the L1 proposer for a certain period. It can basically say, I'm gonna, you know, uh, pay off the people who actually won the sequencing rights. It has the what is called the right of first refusal. So it can just go to everybody. It can basically automatically say, okay, person A, B, and C bought the sequencing rights, and it basically just buys them back from from these people, you know, for uh, Whatever the clearing price was, maybe plus some additional, you know, uh, small fee to 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 um, you know reward uh, the actual winners for their efforts, and then uh, the L1 suddenly, if the L1 uh, proposer buys these back, then it is the sequencer not just for the L1, but also for all the espresso blocks, uh, or for all the all the espresso sort of all the rollups that run on espresso. And um, and the cool thing is that this now enables you to to basically build a shared block between not just Espresso, the uh, rollups that run on Espresso, but also between the L1. And um, the other nice thing about this design is that again, you know, it's you don't need to change the L1 at all. Uh, all we need is that the L1 proposers optionally run some espresso software in order to participate in this marketplace. Um, and it's basically completely optional. It can, it's totally opt-in. So some, some L1 proposers might not, you know, know about this or care about this or whatever, but at some point they do. And when they do, they run some espresso software, and then they can enable this this shared sequencing uh, between the L1 and all of these robots. And yeah, this is sort of the design, and we've talked uh, a bunch with Justin Drake about this design. And you know, I think we're very aligned with uh, sort of the Ethereum Foundation and the Ethereum researchers and Justin on on uh, this style of design. Of course, there's always details to be worked out. Um, but yeah, I think one, one thing that's very nice is, you know, you can have the fanciest designs, but if they require, you know, for example, changing the L1 in a fundamental way, then, uh, it's very difficult. And this is, you know, sort of a very lightweight, um, uh, very lightweight and, um, uh, efficient way to implement this. Cool. Nice. Like, I think, I mean, maybe to be a bit spicy here or something like that is i think it's a super cool experiment it seems in, insanely complex like I to, I to be honest i read about execution tickets and so on but i i wouldn't even be able to describe it right now but i wonder like sometimes like i'm super bullish on ethereum's roll-up centric roadmap and i'm one of the people who usually say yeah who has been saying for two years users shouldn't even use ethereum anymore right like ethereum should be this thing where it's like okay all the applications migrate away to L2s and L3s and so on. And Ethereum is there still to custody the assets. You still issue your asset on Ethereum. Um, you still have a final sequence of everything sort of on Ethereum, which interacts with Espresso sequence. For me, by the way, 
um, to, to my point earlier, like, like for me, uh, Espresso is just a future representation, a prediction on the future of Ethereum that has to be correct, right? The, the problem is we cannot have a multiverse here where there's, there's 20 different versions because we, we want to have a consistent transactional database, right? So, so we need to predict the correct version that we're on and on the correct version that Ethereum will land on. So Espresso is sort of like Ethereum's cousin from the past, right? That basically predicted correctly what Ethereum will look like. And, and, and that's, but yeah, so that's that. But, but like, like Ethereum will only be there to verify proofs to, to have the roll-up bridges and so on, right? And it, uh, so at that point, then I'm wondering, okay, sure, now it seems to be, seems super sexy to sort of be able to have atomic execution with the L1 because nowadays when you launch a new roll-up, you look on, on DeFi Lama and so on and all the liquidity is still on Ethereum, like, oh, damn, how can I tap into that, right? Um, and you have this dichotomy where it's like on the one hand, the liquidity is on Ethereum, but on the other hand, it should really be on a roll-up so that you have cheaper fees and everything. So I think it just at some point with base sequencing, it's super cool, like of a concept and it seems like an engineering sort of wet dream to implement this. <laughs> but on the other hand, isn't is like, isn't this sort of steering away from pushing the applications to the rollups? Like it, it seems like Ethereum is not at this point, 100% sure whether it actually wants to fully embrace the rollup centric roadmap. Um, yeah, because I mean, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure if 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 you don't have any applications on Ethereum anymore, which I believe you probably shouldn't. Um, uh, then it's like, okay, why do you why do you need this uh, to happen on Ethereum still? It's a bit of a contentious question, I guess. But yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's a good question. I think that uh, first of all, I think that um, I don't think sort of Ethereum, you know, will. Of course, like if you draw the extreme version of the, you know, some super extreme version of the future, like, yeah, and, and maybe say like, oh, do we still, you know, really fully need the Ethereum uh, whatsoever and, and so forth. I think that, you know, like these extreme versions of the future, while I, I completely agree with you that, you know, this is, or I mean, I'm, I'm very hopeful that, you know, this is a direction that we're walking in. I think these extreme versions in our, not likely to happen and i think even in the you know 90 percent version of the future there's still uh, a massive uh you know utility for something like for for ethereum for like this really you know this really like basic layer you know um where you can still interact on where you know you have your uh you know your, your bridges your different roll-ups your you know sort of like uh which verifies proofs but also which has um uh you know, maybe some really high value transactions or some stuff like that happening. Um, you know, so I think in the, in the, like, while in the hundred percent version of the future, like, okay, maybe this is, you know, this sort of contentious question comes really, even in the 95% version of the future, I think there's still a, a, we don't have to worry about the value of Ethereum. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, like that there is sort of an, a bit of a risk, uh, question of, uh, you know, is, you know, like, uh, well, if all of the values moving to rollups and all of the values moving to uh, like rollups and sequencing layers and data availability layers and rods as a service, you know, like, um, do we put more value on uh, these things than the, like, like there's the, you know, like, um, uh, but in the end, you know, the entire security is relying on the eco economic security of Ethereum. You know, like this is at some point become a risk, like, you know, if, sort of the value of all of these rollups and everything, you know, that has happening on the L2 fully eclipses what happens on the L1. You know, does this become an attack vector uh, where, you know, someone like then maybe the L1 becomes less secure. Uh, and I think there I actually, you know, I'm very much aligned with sort of uh, uh, eigenlayer and, and sort of the, the economic restaking vision um, because it sort of ensures that, you know, there is economic alignment between, you know, the, the, the layer twos and, you know, the things that are happening on layer two and what is happening on sort of with ETH. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think these are interesting questions. I think that um, I like, I do believe in kind of the future that you lined out, but I do believe sort of always there's always like, you know, a 90% version of it because, you know, new things are happening and new applications are happening. And, you know, maybe, um, 
there's you know gonna be some like uh you know uh, people still massively use eth just you know as a store of value and uh all of these things uh you know and they want to use it on the l1 not on some layer two you know i think that all of these things all of these you know i think still uh, will be important and in all of these versions uh um the l1 still provides a lot of utility that's kind of the yeah, way that I, I view and, it. And don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I, I am not saying Ethereum won't exist. Like, I, I'm just saying Ethereum will be specialized for supporting all of the rollups that are on top and yeah. espresso and so on. And it's more like going to be a more specialized um, non, non application blockchain where, like, uni, basically, I'm saying Uniswap won't be there anymore. But maybe there's also some like things like rollups sharing the same contract on ethereum or something like this like exactly polygons, yeah. egg, polygons egg layer and yeah. so on right like or or, or, or amms built in, into ethereum that uh, sort of are synchronized among five different rollups and so on right like this this maybe i haven't really thought about much to be honest so i think that will happen like this sounds to me like something that would happen yeah. um uh but yeah it's a you know um uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that Ethereum is and will change, like, you know, in the way that it is being used. I think this is like, we see this today. I think this is not a, you know, yeah. and, and more and more applications, as more and more applications move off of Ethereum, I think Ethereum changes, but I don't think it becomes less valuable, yeah, less useful. Like, that's that's the way that I would interpret it. But yeah, it's cool to think about. <laughs> Absolutely. And and we'll we'll see, I guess. All right, cool. So... I'm I'm gonna finish here pushing my analogy once more, because <laughs> uh, like I like that's for me at least the analog, and I just want to hear your take on this. But basically, I, I mentioned it a couple of times now in a couple of different ways. But for me, espresso is a paradigm shift of Ethereum. Ethereum sequencing consensus block building today is essentially Ethereum is looking at the current state or the past and it's saying yes we're voting on this blockchain right so it's always looking back and the blockchain sort of follows this and for mm -hmm. me espresso is like completely the other way around where it's like we are here's espresso and they're building the block of blocks of the future right so they're like basically projecting mm -hmm. we are projecting ourselves into the future and we are mm -hmm. building a version of the future today that we mm -hmm. say is basically already the past because it has already happened even though it's still to be mm -hmm. landed on ethereum even though it's still to be added to ethereum and attested to and mm -hmm. finalized on ethereum we are building this future today and we know it will happen in in 100 percent of the cases right yeah and, and that's like yeah, it's like a fast uh, it's it's like the fast pre-confirmation layer of uh yeah. Of Ethereum, I think that is a hundred percent right, and and you know, like uh, yeah, to get into the physics analogies, it's you know, to some degree, like uh, the the state might be in a bit of a quantum state because I haven't you know uh, looked at the execution yet. I haven't executed it yet. Um, although you know, someone someone may as well execute it and then say what it is. But like, I need to you know sort of execute. I need to observe the state myself. Uh, but you know, as long as everybody like, it doesn't matter who's gonna execute because everybody who executes will get exactly the same result, no matter where yeah. you are uh, on earth. Um, and yeah, I think that's exactly the right, uh, I, I like this analogy. You know, we should, yeah. uh, we, have a, we have a set of uh, coffee memes, you know, for our names, but you know, maybe we need to get into the physics, uh, yeah. <laughs> quantum like, relativity I, realm. That just took me, because I, I just think it's so cool. And, and just to be clear, I mean, that's how Rollup started, right? Like, I think there's this great story about Arbitrum where in the beginning, actually, Arbitrum, the Rollup, um, didn't have a L2 um, uh, sequencing Sequencer, layer, yep. right? It was basically exactly. just people submitted their transactions as call data to their L1 smart contract, and Arbitrum yep. would just execute over them, compress them, and then, uh, and then actually, um, you know, maintain the state DB. Um, yeah. And the, the 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 obvious issue with this was like, okay, great, you have a lot of gas savings, but it's still really slow, right? And actually, yep. I guess what <laughs> people wanted this to be also be faster because like Ethereum is also too slow. So yeah. then Arbitrum goes and they issue these pre-confirmations from a single sequencer. And it's already, basically, they're already giving you this promise telling you, hey, bro, trust me, 
I'm going to post this to Ethereum in exactly that order that I present to you today in the future. So Arbitrum is essentially like a mini version of Ethereum's future, right? So, yeah. so that this, this is like nothing new, but Espresso just takes it to a whole other level by doing this for multiple rollups, including with base sequencing Ethereum itself, where it's just like, okay, we are all coming together and somehow we are constrained by technology. We cannot all execute everything in this decentralized mm -hmm. system. But we found some weird way to work around that limitation. And we're just ordering everything today. Some people are executing it. They're giving these uh, atomic execution pre-confirmation guarantees, right? Some builders and so on, some BT machines. And this stuff will happen in the future. And we know this today and we can live with that knowledge, armed with that knowledge in which we transact today as if it already happened, even though it's still about to happen at some point on Ethereum. So yeah, let's end it here, maybe. No, that that's, uh, sounds great. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, fully aligned with that vision. <laughs> that's awesome. awesome. Nice. And I'm very happy to be uh, working with you guys on, on, on the Gelato side as well. I think we talked about DevNets, TestNets, uh, currently busy, super busy launching Arbitrum, OP and, and Polygon chains. But uh, I'm sure we can find some time soon to actually work on a DevNet here and try out some of this technology that you guys have built and incorporated into our rollup as a service stack. So yeah, awesome to have you on, Benedict. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds good.